Hello and welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership podcast series, the world's largest weekly podcast dedicated to the topic of leadership. My name is Scott Miller and I am honored and privileged each week to serve as your host and interviewer. As you know, we have recently launched the new book called Master Mentors, 30 Transformative Insights from Our Greatest Minds, which is a fast, easy, breezy read where I took 30 of my favorite interviews from our first year and wrote a different chapter about 30 of our guests, something that I thought they said did researched, shared, that was especially profound, transformative even, and I wrote a chapter about it. And of the 30 transformative insights, two of them are actually direct transcripts from their interviews. One, of course, from Trent Shelton, the former NFL football player, author, speaker, inspire, coach, and social media influencer. I really took his transcript and put it into the book because it was so valuable in his own words, word for word. And the other interview that I also took, literally word for word, was from today's guest, Kim Scott, based on her book, Radical Candor, because her discussion of her uh, inspiring learning, the intervention that happened at Google with Sheryl Sandberg was so illuminating. I also took that and put it in word for word. Kim Scott is today's guest and one of the featured mentors in my book, Master Mentors. Pick up a copy on Amazon or your favorite bookstore. And Kim Scott, welcome back to On Leadership. Thank you so much. Uh, it's an honor to be here. Very exciting. And I'm so thrilled for your new book. Uh, excited for to share everything that you've learned with the world. Kim, thank you. First, thank you for agreeing to be uh, featured as a master mentor. It was my love of the book Radical Candor that had me chasing you for several months to get your permission to be featured. Thank you for granting it and thank you for your support of it. Anybody who watches this podcast or knows me or follows me on social media or has worked with or for me know that two of my top five favorite books ever written are, of course, our mutual friends, Liz Wiseman's book, Multipliers, had a profound impact on me, even after my own 30-year career in the leadership industry. And of course, your first seminal book, titled Radical Candor, that uh, has, has, has both validated me and changed the way perhaps sometimes I'm too radical and maybe use too much candor. And today we're here to talk about your newest release called Just Work. Before I get into the insights in Just Work, I want to revisit Radical Candor for a moment because um, one of my values is loyalty. And so when I find a person or a mentor or a thought leader that I like and respect, I tend to evangelize their work, sometimes exhaustively. And you are one of those mentors in my life. And your book, Radical Candor, was, uh, was, well, it was seminal. It was seminal. It was handed to me by a colleague who actually saw you speak, I think, at a Qualtrics event, said, this mm -hmm. is the book that Scott Miller should have written, and handed it to me. And it was very transformative. I would like you to do, I'm going to ask you to share some lessons learned about Radical Candor in a moment. What I'm okay. going to ask you to do, though, is for the benefit of our listeners and viewers around the world, would you recreate in the course of four or five minutes my favorite story from the book, which was the insight and learning you were the beneficiary of when you worked at Google with Sheryl Sandberg and how that impacted your own influence, credibility, speech, hand gestures and such. Take your time and recreate that story and then we'll talk about some other lessons that you've since learned from the book and its readers. Sure, absolutely. So shortly after I joined Google, I had to give a presentation to the founders and the CEO about how the AdSense business was doing. And I walked into the room and there in one corner of the room was Sergey Brin, one of the founders, on an elliptical trainer stepping away wearing toe shoes and a bright blue spandex unitard. Not really what I was expecting to see in the room. And there in the other corner of the room was Eric Schmidt, who was CEO at the time, doing his email. And, and his head is so deep in his computer, it's like his brain has been plugged into the machine. And so probably like all of you in such a situation, I felt a little bit nervous. How in the world was I supposed to get these people's attention? Luckily for me, the AdSense business was on fire. And when I said how many new customers we had added over the last week or so, Eric almost fell off his chair. What did you say? This is incredible. Do you need more marketing dollars? Do you need more engineering resources? So I'm now thinking the meeting's going all right. In fact, I now believe that I am a genius. And I walked out of the room after the meeting was over, walked past Cheryl, who was my boss at the time, and I'm expecting a high five, a pat on the back. And instead, Cheryl says to me, why don't you walk back to my office with me? And I thought, oh, wow, 
I have screwed something up and I'm sure I'm about to hear about it. And Cheryl began the conversation not by telling me what had gone wrong, but what had gone right. Not in the feedback sandwich, I think there's a, there's a less polite term for that, but, but not in the sort of kiss me, kick me, kiss me sense of the word, but really seeming to mean what, he, what she was saying. You know, when, when you presented both sides of the argument in that meeting, it, it really earned you credibility. But of course, all I wanted to hear about was what I had done wrong. And eventually, Cheryl said to me, you said um in there a lot, were you aware of it? And with this, I breathed a huge sigh of relief and I kind of made this brush off gesture with my hand. And I said, yeah, I know, it's a verbal tick. It's no big deal, really. And then she said to me, I know this great speech coach. I bet Google would pay for it. And once again, I made this brush off gesture with my hand. I said, I am busy. Didn't you hear about all those new customers? I don't have time for a speech coach. And then Cheryl stopped. She looked me right in the eye and she said to me, I can see when you do that thing with your hand, I'm going to have to be a lot more direct with you. When you say, um, every third word, it makes you sound stupid. Now she's got my whole attention. <laughs> and some people might say it was mean of her to say that I sounded stupid, but it was actually the kindest thing she could have done for me in, in, in that moment. Because if she hadn't used just those words with me, and crucially, she would not have used those words with other people on her team, but who were maybe better listeners than I am. But if she hadn't used just those words with me, I never would have gone to see the speech coach, and I would not have learned that she was not exaggerating. I literally was saying um, every third word. And this was news to me. I had been giving presentations my whole career. I had raised millions of dollars for two different startups, giving presentations. I thought I was pretty good at it. And this really got me to thinking, what was it about Cheryl that made it so seemingly easy for her to do it? But also, perhaps even more interestingly, why had no one else told me? It was almost like I had been marching through my whole career with a giant hunk of spinach between my teeth. I could get it out if people would tell me it was there, but if I didn't know it was there, I couldn't get it out. And I realized in the case of Cheryl, it really boiled down to two pretty simple fundamental things, which don't seem so radical, but in combination, they are so rare that I call it radical candor. It's caring personally and challenging directly. I knew that Cheryl cared about me, not just as an employee, but as a human being. When I moved from New York to California to take the job at Google, I didn't really know anyone out here and I was very lonely and she could tell that I was lonely and she introduced me to a book group. I'm still friends with a bunch of those women to this day. When, when my father was diagnosed with cancer, Cheryl said, you go get on an airplane and now you need to be with your family. That's where, that's where your place is right now. Your team and I have got your back. We'll write a coverage plan and we'll cover for you. Don't even count it as vacation, just go and be with your family. And that was the kind of thing that she did for everyone who she worked directly with. She couldn't, of course, do that for all 5,000 people in her organization. No matter how talented you are, relationships don't scale. But when a leader cares personally about their direct reports, it's much more likely that their direct reports are going to, in turn, care personally about their direct reports. And that creates a culture of caring that does scale. But of course, it's not all sunshine and rainbows or whatever the expression is. It's not only the care personally part, it's also the challenge directly part. Uh, but I knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that if I screwed up, Cheryl would not let her concern for my short-term feelings, which was real, get in the way of her desire to tell me what I needed to hear in order to grow over the long term in my career. And so that's all radical candor is. Care personally, challenge directly. It's kind of love and truth at the same time. But let's think about what happens when we fail on one dimension or another. Because what radical candor is not, sometimes we, we remember to challenge directly, but we forget to show that we care personally. And this I call obnoxious aggression. In an early version of the book, I called that at the asshole quadrant, because it seemed more, I don't know if I'm allowed to curse on this you, podcast, yeah, exactly. but anyway. Bring it on, bring it on. That's okay. I called it the asshole quadrant because it seemed more radically candid, but I stopped doing that very intentionally. The reason I stopped doing it was because I found as soon as I did that, 
people would start using the this sort of two by two framework with four boxes to start writing names in boxes. And I beg of you, don't use the radical candor framework that way. Think about it, it's not another Myers-Briggs personality test. Think about it like a compass that'll help you guide specific conversations with specific people to a better place. Because we all occasionally are obnoxiously aggressive. Now, one of the big problems with obnoxious aggression, in addition to the fact that it harms other people, is that when we realize we've acted like a jerk, for a lot of people, at least for me, and pro probably for a lot of your listeners as well, it's our instinct to go the wrong way on challenge directly re when we should actually go the right way on care personally. And then we wind up in manipulative insincerity, the worst place of all, where we're neither caring nor challenging. And this is where the false apology or passive aggressive behavior, political behavior, backstabbing behavior, if, if, if obnoxious aggression is front stabbing, manipulative insincerity is backstabbing. And this is where the drama in the workplace comes. If you watch the HBO show Silicon Valley or watch The Office, you're going to see a lot of episodes about obnoxious aggression and manipulative insincerity because this is where the drama comes in. When we talk and complain about things going wrong, wrong at work, we're usually talking about either obnoxious aggression or manipulative insincerity. But the problem is that the vast majority of us make the vast majority of our mistakes when we do remember to show that we care personally, because despite everything you read about on social media, most people are actually pretty nice people, pretty kind people. So we do remember to show that we care personally, but we're so concerned about not hurting someone's feelings that we fail to tell them something they'd be better off knowing in the long run. And this I call ruinous empathy. And my goal with Radical Candor is, is to help, since I think that's the majority of mistakes get made in ruinous empathy, empathy is really to help people move from ruinous empathy over to radical candor. Of course, I want to help with obnoxious aggression and <laughs> manipulative insincerity too, but if we can solve the ruinous empathy problem, I think we'll, we'll, we'll solve a lot of problems. So that's radical candor in a nutshell. Kim, beautifully said, the reason I invited you to recap the story with Cheryl's because I think it nicely illustrates one of Franklin Covey's own luminaries ideas, Stephen M. R. Covey, of course, the son yeah. of our founder, he wrote the book, The Speed of Trust. And Stephen M. R. Covey will tell you that perhaps the biggest gift that a leader can give their colleagues is feedback on their blind spots. And I think the Sheryl Sandberg story shares that beautifully. And I didn't count a single um during your entire retelling of that story. Congrats to you. Uh, since you published the book, however, you've had some feedback, especially from female leaders on how radical candor can work against them as well. Will you take a minute or two and then we'll pivot over to your new book, what are, what are some of the insights you have learned from literally the millions of people who have now have read the book and implemented the concepts? What's the downside and how do we watch out for that? Yeah, I think that very often bias, prejudice, and bullying masquerade as feedback. And, and I learned, you know, if you write a book about feedback, you're going to get a lot of it. And indeed, I did. And some of the most valuable feedback I got after Radical Candor published and uh, shortly after the book came out, I was giving a presentation at a tech company in San Francisco. And the CEO of that company, we'll call her Michelle, had been a colleague of mine for the better part of a decade, somebody I really like and respect enormously, and, uh, and one of too few black women CEOs in tech. And after I gave the Radical Candor talk, she pulled me aside and she said to me, Kim, I really like Radical Candor. I think it's going to help me build the kind of culture I want here. But, she said, I got to tell you, it's much harder for me to put it into practice than it is for you. And she said, as soon as I give someone even the most gentle, compassionate criticism, she explained that she would get slimed with the angry black woman stereotype. And I knew this was true. And as soon as she said it to me, I had sort of three realizations at the same time. The first was that I had failed to be the kind of colleague, the kind of person, the kind of friend that I want to be, that I expect myself to be. I had failed to be an upstander for her. I had failed even to notice the extent to which Michelle had showed up at every meeting we'd ever been in together, unfailingly pleasant and polite and cheerful. And believe me, in that period of time, she had what to be ticked off about. Uh, as we all do at work, but she couldn't show it. So I had failed to be, a, a, at a very basic level, the kind of upstander that I want to be. Uh, I had been sort of in denial about what was happening to her. I also realized <clears throat> that 
I had been in denial about the things that had happened to me as a white woman in the workplace. And it's hard for the, rat, the author of Radical Cantor to admit that she was in denial, but I, I had been. I had sort of failed to recognize the extent to which I had been uh, over and over and over again sort of a victim of different sorts of workplace in, uh, injustices. Uh, and because I never wanted to see myself as a victim. I think we, we have so much complicated uh, uh, media around victimhood. And I also realized that the third realization I had was that I had, I had failed to be the kind of leader that I want to be. I had failed to create the kind of environment in which everyone could do the best work of their lives and enjoy working together. Because I had, I had so often failed to notice even, let alone address, the kinds of, of things that had happened to me and had happened to, to Michelle. And that was really why I sat down to write Just Work. I wanted to sort of break down the problem, because it seems like this sort of monolithic problem. And I wanted to break it down into its component parts so that we could begin to solve the problem. Kim, your book, Just Work, really opens with this concept you mentioned about three, three key ideas, bias, prejudice, and bullying. In fact, about yeah. a year ago, Franklin Covey released our book called The Leader's Guide to Unconscious Bias, how to reframe bias, cultivate connection, and build high-performance teams. It fundamentally had a, an amazing impact on me. I, I edited the book uh, three times, and as a white male executive leader in my 50s, certainly I was more part of the problem than I was the solution. Your book, Just Work, kind of takes it a bit further and makes it a nice complement to our book. Will you talk about these three concepts of bias, prejudice, and bullying. What are the differences and why is that kind of the opening, kind of shot across the bow, so to speak, in just work? Yeah, at a, at a very basic level, I'm gonna offer some super simple definitions to three different attitudes and behaviors that are very complicated. Bias, I'll define as not meaning it. Prejudice, I'll define as meaning it. And bullying, I'll define as meaning harm. And these are three very different problems, and yet we very often conflate them as one. And in fact, I think a lot of the criticism of unconscious bias is that sometimes people pretend like it's all unconscious bias. And sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's very conscious belief. For example, I was sitting in a meeting, chit-chatting right before the meeting with a, a colleague of mine, a, a guy who I enjoyed working with, and he said to me, you know, my wife doesn't work because it's better for the children. And I didn't think he quite meant that in the absolutist term that he stated it. So I tried to make a joke and I said, oh, I decided to show up at work today because I wanted to neglect my children. And I was expecting him to sort of laugh and apologize and we'd move on. But no, it was not unconscious bias. It was a very, he started justifying what he had said and telling me I should read these articles and telling me I was in fact neglecting my children. And so you need to have a very different, if it had been unconscious bias, I think, you know, an I statement, I decided, would, would work. It invites someone in to understand things from your perspective. But if it's a conscious prejudice that you're dealing with, the I statement is not going to be enough because the person doesn't see things from your perspective. And so in this case, I needed an it statement. And, and an it statement can appeal to the law, it can appeal to, it can appeal to HR policy, or it can appeal to common, common human decency or common sense. So it is, it is illegal to tell a woman she's neglecting her children by working. It is, uh, which is a debatable statement. What was not debatable was it is a, an HR violation for you to tell me that I am, that I am neglecting my children for showing up at work, or simply it is ridiculous to tell me I'm neglecting my children by showing up at work today. So that's an it statement. Now sometimes the person has no belief at all. They're unconscious or unconscious. Sometimes they're just bullying you. And in this case, you want a you statement. If an I statement sort of invites someone in to understand things from your perspective, a you statement pushes them away. And I, I actually learned this from my daughter when she was in third grade. She was getting bullied on the playground. And I was suggesting to her, as adults often do to kids, to use an I statement. I feel sad when you blah, blah, blah. And she banged her fist on the table and she said, Mom, he is trying to make me feel sad 
why would I tell him he succeeded? And I thought, gosh, that's a really good point. So a you statement sort of pushes someone away and it also sort of, you're asserting, you're, you're getting the other person to answer your question. So you can't talk to me like that or you need to stop now. Or if that feels like it might escalate the situ situation too much, it can also be a question like, what's going on for you here? Or even, where'd you get that shirt? You just, you wanna be asking the questions uh, and not in the submissive role. So that's bias, prejudice, and bullying in a nutshell, and, and how to respond as the person harmed. Of course, there's a lot of other thoughts I have about how to respond as the upstander or, or how to respond uh, as the leader. Kim, the book is enormously practical. I mean, you, you spend a lot of time say this, don't say that, do this, don't do that. When you're in this situation, here are your choices and here are the outcomes, you know, deleteriously or positively. Let's walk through some of those. I'd heard this term, but I'd never spent much time thinking about it, mansplaining. Uh, yeah. What is mansplaining and why do men need to be aware of that? So the, the, there is a great, there's a great essay. Uh, you should include it in the, in the, in the show notes that uh, Re Rebecca Solnit wrote about men explain things to me. And she's the author of this book about, uh, about this famous person. And she's at this fancy party. And the host of the party starts telling her about her own book. And at first, she's so sort of surprised that she thinks, gosh, there must have been another book written that I wasn't aware of. This is the extent to which we sort of internalize these roles. And, but her friend who was with her realized what was going on and said, that's her book. She wrote that book. And the, the guy is completely un, unfazed. He continues to lecture her on her own book. So that's... And she writes the story much, it, it, it's hilarious. It's, I, I can't do it justice in telling the story. But that's an example of, of mansplaining. And I think there's, there's several reasons why it is so damaging. Uh, Aileen Lee, who started Cowboy VC, tells me, told me a good, really good story about this, where she is, she's going into a meeting with two colleagues who are men. And so they, they walk in and they sit down at this big long conference room table. And Aileen's on one side and the two guys are on her left. And the first guy from the other company walks in and sits across from the guy to her left. The next guy comes in, sits across from the guy to his left. And then everybody files on down the table, leaving Aileen dangling by herself. So very often, there's unconscious bias, this is not mansplaining, it's just in the seating arrangements and, and sort of what we're comfortable, what, where, who we're comfortable sitting across from. And then, as it turned out, Aileen had the expertise that was gonna win her team the deal. And so she starts talking, and when people from the other side have questions, they direct their questions to the two men, to her two partners. And in this case, her partners recognized what was going on, and they knew Aileen had the answers, not them. But, you know, they wanted to sort of keep things going smoothly. So it happened once, it happened twice, it happened a third time. And so in this case, her partners are being asked sort of to mansplain. And finally, one of them realizes what's going on. And he stands up, he uses an I statement. He says, I think Aileen and I should switch seats. And they switch seats and the whole dynamic in the room change. Everyone suddenly realized what they had been doing. And because this was unconscious bias, they, they, were, they felt maybe a little bit of shame, but they stopped doing it. And, uh, and, and it's important to sort of think about why Aileen's partner did this. He did this for two reasons. One was that he cared about Aileen and he didn't like seeing her get ignored. He didn't want to be the mansplainer. But he also did it because he wanted to win the deal. And he knew that, that they wouldn't win the deal if he couldn't get the other side to listen to Aileen because Aileen had the expertise that was gonna win them the deal. And that's kind of what I mean by just work. There's sort of, uh, there's sort of a, uh, a justice element to just work, but there's also a practical element to just work. We wanna just work. Uh, we don't wanna keep dealing with this stuff over and over and over again. And, and the problem with bias, prejudice, and bullying is that it hurts decision making, it hurts collaboration, it hurts our ability to, to build the best teams, uh, and, and ultimately it hurts our results. It is the, the problem, the distraction is not talking about bias, prejudice, and bullying, it's bias, prejudice, and bullying that are the distraction. 
Kim, you mentioned the phrase upstander. It's one of, I think, four profiles you share that all of us kind of fall into, either by you know, reflex or neglect or default or, or lack of courage. Explain what an upstander is and kind of what are the other options we find ourselves aligning to? So very often we're the observer in the room of, of you know, maybe it's bias, maybe it's prejudice, maybe it's bullying. We, we notice something or maybe it's, maybe it's something worse. Maybe it's discrimination, harassment, or a physical violation. But we notice this happen. Uh, we observe this happen happening. And now we have a choice. We can either be an upstander, and an upstander is someone who intervenes, or we can be the silent bystander. And then very often we wind up, it's one of those incidents that wakes us up at 3 in the morning. We wind up feeling guilty about it, so it has a negative impact. Or we go into denial. And unfortunately, denial is probably the most, uh, the most common, it certainly was, was something that, that I am guilty of doing more often than not. And so what I'm hoping for in the book is that when you observe uh, something happening, even though you're not harmed by it and you're not the person who's causing harm, that you, you intervene in some way. And, and you intervene in a way in, in the spirit of helping not only the person who's harmed, but also the person who's doing the harm, because very often the person who's causing the harm isn't, doesn't even understand what they're doing, isn't even aware of what they're doing. So you're helping, you're helping everyone when you become an upstander. So that's, that's the role I think most of us play uh, most often. But sometimes we are harmed, the, we're the person harmed. Some, sometimes we're the person who causes harm, and sometimes we're the leader. And when we are the leader, it's, it's really our job to prevent these things from happening. But of course, they're going to happen anyway, despite our best efforts. Welcome to being a leader. Your job is to prevent the inevitable. And so in those cases, when despite your best efforts, things happen, you've got to respond again in a way that, that makes it less likely that they'll happen again, prevents them from happening again. So I think those, those four roles and being conscious, sometimes you're playing more than one role at once. Sometimes you're, you're both the person harmed and the leader at the same time or you're, you're the person who causes harm and the leader, and that's a, really bad, uh, that's a really bad combination. And so being aware of what role you're playing and what you can do when you're playing that role to, to get things to a better place. And Kim, in your book, you're kind of an equal opportunity, not offender, but inspirer, because it isn't just men or just women or just Caucasians or non-Caucasians. You share a lot of the word choices. I've been in meetings where, where a woman that I work with has said, you know, come on, be a man. Or yeah. there's been, you know, countless occasions when I've walked into a room with men and said, good morning, ladies, thinking I was being funny, but clearly not. The book is a great, <laughs> valuable resource. I love your quote on page 107 where you say, um, uh, how to realize when you are bullying others and stop it. Uh, I am not an asshole, but like all of us, I do sometimes behave like one. Would yeah. you recap for us the story about, I think it was a radio host and the discussion around Amy Cuddy, who's come under some, you know, critique and quite serious um, spotlight the last couple of years. Will you kind of recreate that story and the learning from it? Absolutely. So I was doing a podcast with Russ Laraway, who's actually about to come out with a fantastic leadership book. So I'll introduce you to him. So Russ and I were co-founders of a company and we, we co-hosted a podcast. And we were, we were talking about Amy Cuddy and her, her uh, sort of power pose research. And I had not really done my homework and I just started talking. And I, by the way, I love Amy Cuddy. And I've used, I actually, I do this before, uh, before I go on and do a presentation. Like I find her, her research very helpful. And in fact, some of the women who I've coached in the course of my career when I show them her video, it, it's, it can be transformative. So I had a lot of emotion, and I also felt that Amy at this moment in time was sort of getting bullied in, uh, in, in, with her research. Uh, but I hadn't really looked into it. I had kind of uh, an instinctive response. And I said something along the lines of, you know, it actually increases testosterone when you do the power pose. And, uh, and decreases cortisol or so, I don't remember what it was. But anyway, at this point, Amy herself, Amy Cuddy herself had said, actually, 
this is a debatable assertion. It's not clear. Uh, it's not clear that, that these hormonal levels really change that much, but the psychology of it is very clear. And so Russ tried to point out to me that uh, that I had my facts wrong. And uh, instead of listening to the feedback, which was what the whole podcast was about, I said, "Oh, Russ." You were born doing a power pose, because Russ is a very tall, imposing white man who was in the Marines. So, uh, uh, so, so, and it was all, all of the people who were producing the podcast, everyone in the room, everyone was a woman. And we all roared with laughter and shut Russ down. And this had really, it was, it was unkind to Russ. It also had a bad impact. It, I, I was violating everything I said I believed in <laughs> in the podcast. And then people wrote in. It was really, it was one of those messes that one creates by acting like a bully uh, instead of actually listening to one's colleagues. And, and I, really, I, I really care about Russ. I really respect Russ. Why did I behave that way? You know, sometimes when you've been in in the minority in so so many cases in your career, and suddenly you find yourself in the majority, uh, one doesn't behave as well as one should. So I'm sorry, yeah. Ross. Yeah, I, I've never been there, so I'm captivated listening to your experience. Uh, no, I have been there countless <laughs> times, people. <laughs> Kim, the book is extraordinary. You, it's really a leadership manual, right? It's not a diatribe. It's not a political book, it's not a discourse on society, but it is a, a kind of wake up call for a lot of us that have been in our careers for a couple of decades and have fallen into patterns and feel like we have some perhaps positional power or our influence or contrib contribution, you know, inoculates us against offenses and things. It's a, it's a book I, I recommend every formal leader of people read because you'll become much more aware of your biases, conscious and unconscious, your prejudices, and how all of us tend to bully. Let's close out our conversation with um, not just what not to do, but what to do. You have a whole section around apologies and yeah. the right and wrong way to apologize when we find ourselves either being caught or catching ourselves in our biases, prejudices, and bullying. Will you give us a couple of tips on both sides? Don't do this, but rather do and say that when you're in an opportunity where your apology could in fact um, correct a situation that you were involved in or didn't stand up for or created yourself. Yeah, or, or your apology can actually make things much, much worse. Yeah. I, I wanna start by acknowledging when, when I find myself in the role of the person who caused harm and, and probably when every single one of your listeners find themselves in that role. And we all do cause harm. Everyone causes harm to others from time to time. And, and we suddenly become aware that we have caused harm. For most people, we feel a great sense of shame when we become aware. And, and sometimes the shame is, is doubly strong because sometimes someone points out that you've done something wrong and you know they're right, but you don't know quite what you've done wrong. And that is really, really difficult. So Wait, you just I described my marriage. That was my marriage. <laughs> 12 years. <laughs> Keep going, please. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It happens in all kinds of different relationships. And so what do you do in that moment? I think learning how to move through the shame and not be, because very often, when we're ashamed, we don't we don't respond well. It's it's our, we we get defensive. We actually have a fight or flight yeah. response. Yeah. And we we're, our our everything we consciously believe goes out the window, and so I think the first thing I would I would advise people is learn how to notice what shame where shame shows up in your body, so you can know when you're in a shame response because you're not going to respond well when you're feeling ashamed. Like for me. I feel it in the back, the back of my knees starts to tingle in the mm. same way that it does if I walk up to the edge of a precipice. It's a physical terror. Uh, and, and, and I know I'm not gonna respond well. So, so learn how to recognize shame in yourself. It's not, and it's usually not because I'm being shamed, it's because I feel ashamed. And so I've gotta own that feeling of shame. I will tell you a story. There was, I was giving a, I was giving a talk 
And I made uh, what I thought was an offhanded joke about, like, I'm small, blonde, and Southern. Who could be intimidated by me? And of course, I wasn't. I know now what I did wrong. I wasn't thinking about the other side of those stereotypes. And, uh, and someone pointed out to me, and they were very upset. It was clear that I had really, really harmed someone. But I, I didn't quite know what I had done wrong. And what I did was I apologized and moved on. Instead of stopping and saying, I am really sorry, I've screwed up and I don't even know what I did wrong. Because now I'm doubly ashamed. Not only have I harmed someone, I'm ignorant. And so that's tricky. It's a tricky situation to be in. So I want everyone to give themselves a little bit of grace in those moments so that you can give yourself the opportunity to respond well. So the things to do are to acknowledge what you did wrong and also acknowledge if you, if you don't know what you did wrong. And to don't demand that that other person educate you, but educate yourself. In, in the case of my having made the small blonde southern comment, I actually hired a bias buster to, uh, to explain to me exactly what I had done wrong. If you are not in a position to hire someone, Google will give you all kinds of really good insights. Uh, it, it, so, so Google it and try to understand. Educate yourself. Take, take, take whatever steps you can to educate yourself. So, so that is really important, is learning how to acknowledge what, you, what you've done wrong. I think the other thing is to learn how, what are you going to do to make amends? What are you going to do to make it right, to make sure that you don't make the same mistake again? And it's very, again, this often requires that you are patient and kind with yourself and that you ask others for help. There was one CEO I was working with, and he was working really hard not to say you guys when he was addressing his whole company. But it's tricky because th these habits of speech are very difficult to change. It's like getting rid of the ums. He needed a speech coach. And he needed to, to like, be persistent, be patient with himself, but also be persistent with himself. So figure out what you're going to do to make amends. Um, so acknowledging what you did wrong is hard, and then figuring out how to, how to make amends is really important. Kim, this last three or four minutes might, in fact, be the most valuable piece of our conversation. I was talking recently with a fairly famous author, uh, educator, uh, coach, uh, happens to be a woman who is gay. Uh, I guess I mean she's a lesbian. She referred to herself as gay. And I was talking with her about members of the LGBTQ plus I community. And I kind of got hooked up on the I because I heard I recently. And even she said, I don't know, I've lost track myself and kind of didn't dismiss it. But, you know, she talked about how it's become even so confusing for her. My point in, in mentioning that is what advice do you have for all of us that are asking ourselves, where does it stop? Where is it going? What can I say? What can I not say? What can I do? What can I not do? I can't be in a room alone with a woman. Well, wait, yes, I should be, because if I'm in alone with a woman, I should be alone or shouldn't be alone with a man. And you know, a lot of, if you read your entire book, you leave inspired, but you could argue a little bit paralyzed because you, you debunk, you challenge, you inspire us through so many of our, our patterns in life where I, I'm guessing the momentum of respect, Southern white, small girl is now offensive to many people. And I'm probably just, even might be telling you this is offensive to some people. Where are we headed and what advice would you give us on how not to get frustrated, but to have a lens of what? To have a mindset of what? I think you wanna have a growth mindset about this. And this is very difficult because, because it's, it's, it's hard enough to have a growth mindset about learning math or you know a skill. Uh, I, I, and I think we, we widely acknowledge how important that is, how a fixed mindset where you're either good in math or bad in math is not going to help you get better in math. And I think when it comes to becoming the people we want to be, like who we are, or even issues that, of, that we consider issues of morality, it's much harder to have a growth mindset. Like I really want to be a good person, and in order to be a good person, I need to be able to recognize when I've done bad things. At some level, I, I keep coming back to 
the words of my son's baseball coach. Uh, I was watching, they were, they were finishing up some drills, I was picking them up, and this kid was running around, it was a, you know, you, you had to touch each, each of the bases as you ran around, and the kid wasn't touching the bases with his foot. And the coach kind of yelled at him, you got to touch the bases. And the kid said, I was touching the bases. And the coach looked at him and he said, you can't do right if you won't notice what you're doing wrong. And, uh, and so I think if we can all go into these situations acknowledging, like expecting that we're sometimes going to get it wrong, we're going to say the wrong thing, we're going to do the wrong thing. But, but if we're open to learning about what we did wrong and making it right, then I think we can move forward. I think the, the worst thing that can happen is if we're afraid to speak to one another. One of, the, one of the saddest stories I heard as I was researching this book was there was, there was a, a man I knew who worked at a tech company and a woman who he worked with uh, who was in marketing had named her marketing campaign um, Rolling Thunder. And, and this guy knew that if she knew the history of Rolling Thunder, she wouldn't have named her marketing campaign that. But he didn't want to tell her. And he didn't want to tell her because he didn't want to be accused of mansplaining or being an asshole or something like that. And, uh, and so he didn't say anything. And this was, this was a man who cared deeply about his colleagues. Like, he, he believed in radical candor. Uh, but he didn't say anything. And, and it was also hard for me because in this case, I knew the woman and I knew she would have wanted to hear. And so I think we've got to be willing to take some risks. And I think especially, especially if you're the leader, if you're in, in the, in the, if you're in the majority, if you have a position of power, if you're not willing to take some risks and to get it wrong and to learn how to acknowledge when you get it wrong and make amends, and so you want to apo acknowledge, apologize, get it wrong, I mean, get it right, uh, don't get it wrong again. Although you will get it wrong again, mm -hmm. but try yeah. to get it right. Yeah. Work, show the steps you're taking to get it right, to make it, to make it right in the future then I think we, we can all respond to these moments with a little bit of agency and a little bit of grace. We give ourselves grace, we give others grace, but we keep fixing the problem. We don't retreat into denial, which is the most common place where we hang out. Mike Drop, finish with Kim Scott, author of Radical Candor and Just Work. Hey, what an honor to have you back on two times in a couple of years. Thank you. Many things you could have done with your time today. Appreciate you joining us. We look forward to the next big seminal book. Uh, just Work is the kind of book that leaders shouldn't just buy for themselves. You want to buy a dozen copies for members of your team and sit around and read a chapter, literally, like week by week, and just talk, you know, have this sort of vulnerable conversation on when are we in denial and what can we do to use our positional power and our influence to build a workplace of inclusiveness. As Kim said, the question really isn't where is it going? Where is it going to stop? It's do you have a growth mindset? And Kim, I appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Best of success to you. Thank you so much, Scott. Really enjoyed it. Thanks to you all. We'll see you back here next week for another episode on leadership.